Uh, we are in a series called Under God, and today we are concluding that series and excited to be able to share uh, what I have for you today with you. I um, believe it's going to be powerful, uh, and if it's okay with you, I'm going to jump right in, okay? So uh, we're going to look at a scripture in John chapter 1, and if you've missed any of the, the past messages of this series, encourage you to go back and, and check these out, uh, listen to them, and be challenged by them. But today, um, we're concluding, we're going to start with John chapter 1, starting in verse 1, here's what it says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, talking about Jesus. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then in verse 14, says this, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. What did he come from the Father with? He came full of grace and truth. Somebody say it with me. He came full of grace and truth. This is what we know about Jesus. He embodied both grace and and truth and for us today the challenge for us is how do we live this out how do we show grace to our communities to our world and still live with truth show the truth of God's worth in in, in a world in a culture in a society that's moving away from the things of truth how do we live this out. Let's begin today with a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would speak what you want to encourage us with today. God, let it be your words, God, as, as we hear from your holy word today. Let it challenge us. Let it grow us, God. We thank you. We give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, Amen. For decades, most people in our country embraced Jesus. It's just the truth, right? For years, people just went to church back in the, the 50s and 60s. People just went to church because that, that's what you did. People more naturally embraced the things of God. They embraced Jesus. I'm sad to say that in our society today that this is no longer true. According to Barna Research, uh, well-known research institute, 50% of Americans now identify as post-Christian. Uh, you may say, Jason, I don't know what that means. What do you mean post-Christian? I, I, don't, I don't comprehend. Let me, let me explain to you. You can imagine what pre-Christian, so pre-Christian is, you'll see a definition there on the screen, pre-Christian is simply there, there's no real exposure to or understanding of the Christian faith. They've never experienced, they've never heard of potentially, they've never been around the things of God all that much. Now you can imagine Christian, right, that, that definition we shouldn't have to explain, but post-Christian then is having some exposure to and some understanding of the Christian faith and yet choosing to reject it. So it's those that have experienced the things of God. Maybe they've been in church before. Maybe they've been around people of faith, but they've said, you know what, I've tasted it, I've experienced it, and you know what, I just, I don't think I want that. That's not for me. I don't want any of that, no thank you. I don't care for it. In our culture, faith in Christ has moved from the center to really being 
more on the fringe, where most people were, this is how I live, this is kind of the center. It's, it's moved more to becoming kind of a, a fringe ideal. It's moved from being something that was at one point in time very positive to now being something that is seen as kind of a threat, more negative if you look at the media, if you, if you look at society in general. And this is very unfortunate. I, I'm, I'm not ashamed to be considered a Christian. That, that, that is what I am. I'm a Christian. I'm not ashamed of that. I, I, I claim that. I am that. However, the term Christian has become something that is somewhat loaded these days. People are a little bit concerned when they hear the term Christian. Evangelical Christian, which is what I am also, simply means someone who shares their faith, believes the things of God, and then shares their faith. And that term is even more loaded and, and is something that, if you watch the news, is associated with hate and bigotry. And again, that is unfortunate. Am I, because of these things, scared and running for the hills and Oh my goodness, what in the world are we going to do? Not at all. Not at all. Because here's what I know is that as the world gets darker, the light shines brighter, right? And even as I read in that scripture, he is the light that shines in the darkness. Jesus is that. And if he is with us and on the inside of us, then we can be that as well. Jesus didn't tell us to hide from the world. What did he say? He said, go into all the world, right? Go into the world and make disciples. What does this mean? It simply means this. We don't run from culture. We influence it. We don't run away from the things that are going on around us. We don't hide from the things that are going on around us or that we may be worried or concerned about. We find ways to influence but we have to recognize at the same time that the climate of the world that we're in today is what it is. And we have to recognize it so that we can be responsive and engaging to a world that needs Jesus more now than ever, I believe. And so it's important that the people of God be able to recognize, understand, and live out their faith in an honest and right way. The world needs to see, needs to see Jesus followers successfully and faithfully living for him. Amen? So, the question is, how do we faithfully live for Jesus in a post-Christian culture? How do we faithfully live this out? How do we do this? How do we live for Jesus when everything around us says differently or shows something differently or acts differently from these things? How do we do this? How do we live this out? This is something that we should be considering and thinking about regularly. How do we live out our faith in a post-Christian world? I mentioned before, Barna Research says that 50% of our world today considers themselves post-Christian. Post-Christian. So, if that's the case, there's a lot that as believers of God we can do. So, here's the first thing. If we're going to live out our faith, we must live with grace and truth. We must, just like Jesus did, we must live with grace and with truth. Going back to verse 14 again, let me read it to you again. The Word became flesh. Who is that? That's Jesus. The Word became flesh. Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He came to earth fully man, fully God. He came to earth, made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who 
came from the Father. He was sent from the Father, from heaven to earth, full of what? Grace and truth. He came full of grace and truth. If Jesus did this, we can as well because of Christ living in us. As Christ followers, we know that this is what Jesus did. We can do the same. And one of the biggest challenges when we're dealing with this, when we're talking about one of the biggest challenges is the challenge of leaning too far one way versus the other. It's one of the biggest challenges with living out grace and truth because it's real easy if we're not careful to to allow the pendulum to swing one way or the other and what happens is it, it, it becomes a real challenge a real sticking point a real push off if you will from those who may consider the things of God because here's the deal truth is what the Bible says, right? Truth is what God's Word says. But if you're like me and you kind of grew up in the church, anybody here, you grew up in the church? Anybody out there? A few? Okay. Then you've probably heard people in the church, you know, and they're like, that's what the Bible says, and if the Bible says it, that's it, and that's what we do, and you got to just live like that. And if you don't, you're a sinner, and you're going to hell in a hand basket, and that's just the way to... You got to do this with that voice because it just makes it better when you do it with a certain voice. You're going to hell in a handbasket, and if you don't do it like this, it just got to be like this. It's got to be according to the word of God, you know. And, and it, it, that, they just they come across with it's truth, it's truth, it's truth, and it's got to be truth. It's got to be like this, and you got to look at it like this. And if you don't, well, then you're a sinner going. And the problem with that is it just man, it's so abrasive, right? It's so abrasive, and, and, and we have to be careful, and maybe some of you are even worried because, you know, maybe around the holiday time, like when we're getting ready to celebrate, you have those in your family that you get around, and they can tend to be that way, right? And just, this is the way it's got to be, and it's got to look like this, and there's, there's truth in that, but we have to be careful when we're all the way that, to that side. Grace is... If we're on the side of grace, it, it's, it's, you know, I'm okay, you're okay, everything's okay, and hey, we're just going to, we love the Lord, and we're just going to do whatever, and we can do whatever, we can live however we want, and it doesn't matter, oh, you did that, okay, it's okay, it's okay, because everything's just okay, and we can live, everything, we just claim Jesus, and it's okay, and it's okay, and it's going to be all right. And, and, and unfortunately, again, that's the opposite side and it doesn't matter how you live or what you do or whatever because grace covers it. And, and, and unfortunately, that is not any, any better than the hard line truth. We, we have to be able to recognize Jesus came with both, right? Jesus came with grace and truth. And so how do we live in the balance of this? How do we live with this? What happens if we live with truth but no grace? Here is truth without grace, it leads to rules and rebellion. Truth with no grace leads to rules and rebellion. If you grew up with, you know, lots of rules and, you know, it's got to look like this and it, it, it tends towards legalism and, and listen, I've seen it. I, I, I've seen it and, and, and experienced it and remember it and... and I've seen people have to walk through it, and, and there, there are people, even in their own homes, just, it's, man, this, this, you know, it's got to be like this, it's got to look like this, and, and, and that's, with, with truth with no grace is legalism. You can't go to movies, you know, lipstick, no secular music, and because that might lead to dancing, and we certainly can't have any of that, you know? I mean, it just... <laughs> it, 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 we, we got to be, it's these rules, these rules, these rules. I... Went to Bible college, loved my time at Bible college. I, I did. I learned a lot, grew a lot, but I went to Bible college um, in the late 90s. Dates me just a little bit, okay? But 
I went to college in the late night, and, and they still, this very traditional college that I went to, and I loved it. I loved being there, learned a lot. It was great. Some great relationships that I have to this day from them. But, I mean, they had rules. Let me just tell you, 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 the, you the ladies, they, you couldn't wear open-toed shoes in, 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 in the buildings. No open-toed shoes. Somebody might see your toes, and, <laughs> I mean, they might stumble over those Toes. I don't know who in the world would stumble over toes, you know, and lust a little bit over. I just can't imagine. But that was the deal. You couldn't have, you know, the skirts had to be like down to the ankles and just all this kind of stuff. I mean, it was it, rules, rules, you know. It had to look like this. And what happens is, 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 you know, when you have rules, 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 it leads to rebellion. And here's the thing: rebellion is when you know what's right. You know what you're supposed to do. You know what the rules are, but you just don't care anymore, right? We as humans, we naturally, we naturally rebel against the things of God. We just do. Our, our sin nature naturally rebels against the things of God. Uh, you don't have to look far to know that, that this is true, right? You take any two-year-old and... They will example this regularly, right? I mean, they, you tell them, you do not touch this, do not, and they'll look right at you. And they will touch it, right? I mean, and they just, because they're going to they're gonna test the limits, they're going to rebel again. I mean, you can, you can look at them, you know, and are you doing a duty? Are you doing a duty in your britches right now? Are you doing... Oh, I'm not doing that. Do you need to go? Are you sure you don't need to go to the bathroom? No, I don't need to. All the while they're doing a duty right in their britches at that moment. And, you know, I mean, they don't care. They'll... <laughs> Some of you are having a problem with the fact I said duty on the stage. It is... <clears throat> I, I, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. We tend to just rebel against authority, and, and as, as adults, our authority is God, and we, we tend to just push back against it. It's, it's, it's our nature to want to push back and to rebel, and, 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 and it's, it, it's just part of who we are, and, and rules, and it got to look like this, and too much truth of just, it's got to be this with no grace, this, this is the way it's got to be, just, it, it, it breeds rebellion because we tend to push back against that anyway, and it, it forces that, and, and, and let me just tell you, parents, the, the, the quickest way for our kids to push back is to, to have all rules and no relationship, it's the quickest way for teenagers to, to want to just, I, I'm going to do my own thing because, I, I, you know, because it's naturally there anyway. And when there's no relationship that pulls us towards the things of God and says, this is so much better. It's truth because it's, it's good for you. It's healthy, it's hard truth and no grace. It, it, it'll push rebellion. And listen, listen, I have to be honest. I tend toward this sometimes in my own life because I like things, I like things cut and dry. I like things to be like this and I like, you know, things to be in their place and I want it to be like, it. and you do it like this because there's a right way to do it and a wrong way and you're going to do it the right way because this is the way I'm telling you to do it and you do it like this and this is the way it should be and you do it like that and, you know, because that's right. It's true. And I tend toward anybody else like that. You don't have to raise your hand, okay? I won't even look. But it, you may be out there, and you know what I'm talking about. You, it, you like like this. Whereas God gave me a beautiful, wonderful, incredible wife who is the exact opposite to, of me. I mean, the exact opposite. And it's a good thing. And she's like, oh, it's okay. Oh, you went, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yes, it's okay. That's good. Oh, yes, you can do that. Yes, sure. Yeah. And, and, and I'm over here, no, it's going to look like this. It's going to be like that. And, oh, yes, okay, it's so good. And, and here's the thing, is that it's not okay, and I had to learn this. It's not okay for me and in my home 
for me to be extreme this way and for her to be the extreme this way and that balance us out, that, that's not good enough. Yes, that's, that's healthy and that's good because she brings balance to my life, but she brings balance to me to pull me this way so that I would learn to walk in more grace. And I'm responsible for that. I have to example, I have to, to show and live with grace because it's not okay for me to just be, oh, I'm the truth person and somebody else can be the grace person and I'm just going to be this way and it's going to be this way and it's going to be like this and you better get it right or you're just going to go somewhere else. That's not okay. I have to be pulled into balance sometimes and I have to learn to live with both. I have to learn for myself to be a person both truth and grace. And she has to learn that, you know, God put me in her life so that I can pull her to a little bit more structure of, hey, we need to do this and it's got to be like that. And you see what I mean? But it's her, she has to live in that. She has to walk in that. So we each have our own place in being able to, to live this out. Here's the, here's the second thing is that grace without truth leads to do whatever and believe whatever. Do whatever, believe whatever. It's, it's, it's license, do whatever. Just license to do whatever you want or believe whatever is, is relativism. God understands your life. It's your life. No one else has the right to tell you how to live. It's, it's relativism. It's, if it feels good to you, go do it. Do whatever you want because that's what you feel like is good for you. Then just go do it. It's, it's okay. It's, it's, it's kind of a, uh, a God, God says, you know, he, above all else, God wants me happy more than anything else. If I'm happy, then that's what God wants more than anything else, which is not true. It's not in Scripture, by the way. I'm just making fun a little bit. But that's, that's kind of how we tend is when, when, when we're grace with no truth, it's just I do whatever I want, live however I want. I believe in Jesus, so that means I can just do whatever I want because Jesus cares about me and he cares about my wants. And here's, here's the deal. My fear is, is that there are people today that are, are getting just enough of the things of God, just a taste of the things of God, little snippets here and there to make them feel good, and then it's enough for them to say, well, I can just kind of go do whatever I want, you know, because that's what, that's what God wants for me. It's kind of like, you know, getting the flu shot. From what I understand, when you get the flu shot, they give you just a little bit of the flu, right, when you get your shot. It's a little bit of the flu so that your body can build up an, an immunity against it. And, and I think that for some people in the church today, they've gotten just enough of the things of God, just enough of church that they're building up an immunity because as you say, well, I know this and I know just enough scripture to be dangerous and so I can do, God wants me to do whatever, I, as long as I'm happy and, and whatever. And unfortunately, there's no real depth. There's no real desire to go in, in, to a greater relationship in, in the things of God to, to, to really know and fulfill the purpose that God has for us and to be able to point others to the truth of God's word. We live in a culture that says do whatever and believe whatever. And, and, and we have to be careful that we're, we don't swing too far on, on the, the grace side that we lose out on what's, what's healthy and what's good. It's grace and truth, grace and truth. Uh, let, let, me, let me point this out here real quick. In the book of John, did you notice that grace is listed before truth, right? It's grace and truth. Now, I can't, I can't prove it, but I just kind of think that maybe it leads with grace because we should lead with grace. Maybe grace is first and listed first in there because as the people of God, maybe it's important for us, the people of God, to lead with grace. Because if we come out hard swinging with truth, it, it, it can tend to be abrasive a little bit. But maybe we need to lead with grace. Maybe we need to show people the love of Christ first. And that's why we say 
oftentimes, you may have heard us say this, that we will be a safe place for people to belong even before they believe. We want people to feel comfortable about coming and participating and being a part here at church, feel comfortable coming and sitting, even if they don't believe the way that we believe. We want them to be able to feel safe about doing so. We want to to lead with grace and even that they can come and belong even before they behave the way that we do, even before it becomes habit, even before it becomes something that they do. You can come and you can be here even if you don't do the same things that we do or the things that, that the Word of God would challenge us to do. Why is that so important is because, listen, we want to lead with grace and we want people to feel welcome so that they can receive the things of God and embrace them. And then guess what happens? When, when, you, when you have it in your heart, when God comes and he begins to work on your heart, the outward will, will, will begin to change. It takes longer, but it will begin to follow suit. We want God to challenge and and, and change people's hearts first. And maybe that's why we need to lead with grace. Our message can't be just change your behavior. You've got to look like us. If you just look like us, then you can be a part of us. That shouldn't be our message. The gospel says our message is come follow Jesus and he will lead you to to fullness of life, right? And so we want want to lead with grace. In a post-Christian generation, they're, they're so skeptical about truth. They're so skeptical that, you know, if you claim you have truth, if you, if you say you have absolute truth and that's absolute truth, oh, that's, that's dangerous. How can you say that that's true? How can you know that that is really the truth? And here's what I know. A post-Christian generation isn't searching for certainty as much as they are honesty. We don't have to beat it over the head or them over the head with it. This is the way it is, and we have the truth, and you don't, and that kind of thing. No, no, no. They're looking for honesty. You know what? I don't always get it right. There's times I fall short. You know what? I've messed up many times in my life. And let me just tell you, if it wasn't for the goodness of God, if it wasn't for the goodness of God, let me just tell you my story. That's what a post-Christian generation is looking for, real honesty. And so if that's the case, let me get real honest. Let me get real honest. The church, not just this church, not just Valley Community Church, but the church at large, we haven't always gotten it right. We haven't always done this well. We've, we, we've done some things, said some things, even pushed too hard at times about things and, and, and that's not good. And because, I, you know, some people would come in and say, oh, I don't even, you know, I don't even like all those Christian, you know, those church people. I don't even like, you know, they're, they're a little bit crazy. Well, you know what? I don't like all of them either. <laughs> they can be a little bit crazy. <laughs> and that's okay. We don't have to, we don't, we don't have to, be best friends with every everyone but we do have to love people and that includes people who don't even think the way that we do or believe the way that we or behave the way that we we can love people and that's what we ought to be doing there are so many people who who have been hurt by church and by church people and we need to recognize and realize that listen we can do this better we can do this better and as a church we want to make sure that that's what we're doing. We're, we're leading with grace, but we're not compromising the truth. People have said, I've heard people say, truth is restrictive, repressive, and oppressive. But that's not right. No, no, not at all. Truth is freeing, liberating, and life-giving. When you really get the truth of God's Word, it is freeing. It's liberating. It's life-giving. When you really understand the truth. In the garden early on, in the garden of Eden, God told Adam and Eve, he said, listen, everything here, everything here is available to you except for this one tree. Don't eat of this. And listen, they had to be able to have choice, right, to choose the things of God. But he said, listen, this is what you can do. You can have all this stuff, just not this. Why? Because, listen, the truth is this isn't healthy for you. 
What, what, what as, as mankind, our nature, just it tends toward rebellion and, and we moved away from God and, and we've seen the effects of that from the beginning. But here's what we need to understand. Truth isn't all about just, it's got to look like this and you're just trying to keep me from having a, a good time and all this kind of stuff. It's not, that's not... That's not truth. Truth is, is good. It's life-giving. It's, it's great when we understand that truth isn't rules. Truth is a person. Truth is Jesus who loves us and wants good for us. And wants to lift us up and help us on a good path, on a healthy path towards good things. And when we live with truth and grace together, we understand that truth is good. Truth is so good and it helps guide our feet, guide our path and set us toward what God has for us that is good. That is so good because God is a, a loving God and he wants us to have good things. For so long, for so long, churches, they, 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 they realize, well, people aren't just coming to church anymore because, you know, they, they, they should or they know they should or they think they should. Now, you know... It's a little bit harder, and so we've got to do some things to spice it up. It can't be so boring anymore. We've got to do something a little bit different, and we've got to, you know, make it a little bit more entertaining, a little bit more fun. And so what did churches start doing? They started swinging towards, oh, let's, let's make sure that people get excited about coming to church, and it's, it's good. And we, we create this style where people will have fun, and, and it looks good, and, it, and it's the cool thing. It's the cool thing to go to church, and we're going to go, we go to that church, and it's cool, that's a cool church, and they got a cool pastor, and he, you know, he wears the, the skinny jeans, and he, you know, he dresses cool, and he's got the hairdo that just flops over like this, and it's great, and it's perfect, and everything's in place, and, and they're cool there, you know, and the problem is, is, you know, after a while, cool fades away. And if there's, if, if it's only just about, you know, grace and doing whatever you want, and having fun and looking good, what happens is it, there, there, there's no truth to, to keep the substance there and really get us to a place of growing deep in the things of God. And it can't just be, you know, swinging way over this way just to, just to get people to come to church. It, 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 there, there's got to be a balance. There's got to be both. People aren't searching for a church that's cool, but a Savior that's real. That's what people want. That's what people need. Who is Jesus? He's the Word that became flesh, the Lamb of God, full of grace and truth. He confronted hypocrisy. That's the truth. He confronted it. He went straight on, head first, confronting hypocrisy when he saw it with the truth. But he also comforted sinners with grace. What's the truth? With truth, he saw Pharisees who were out of line, and he called them a brood of vipers. He called them snakes, and he said, listen, you're not living according to the truth. You're hypocrites. And he spoke to them with truth, but he also spoke to the, the lady at the well who was living in a moral lifestyle, and he said, listen, what you really need is living water, and then you'll never thirst again. And he spoke to her with grace, with truth. He went into the temple, and when they were degrading it and, and, and making it a, a, a den of thieves, basically, where they were, they were uh, had money and, and all the stuff that they were doing and selling and exchanging and all that stuff, he tipped over the money changers and ran them out. Why? He was speaking truth. This is not right. And he spoke truth to them. But with tax collectors and sinners, he enjoyed supper. He spent time and ate with them, even criminals. He called them to follow him and change the world. He spoke truth. He called out duplicity. He slammed hypocrisy. He hated pretenses, but he loved the outcast and touched lepers, befriended prostitutes, grace. Listen, there's no better example in Scripture of grace and truth at work than the woman who was caught in adultery. Maybe you don't know the story, but you can, you can certainly look it up. A lady was, was caught in adultery right in the very act, Scripture says. And we don't know if, if this was somebody that the guy was very high up in the government. We don't know if he was someone of influence. We don't know if he 
it was her employer and had power over We don't know what the situation was exactly, but we don't know nothing about the dude. We don't know. He wasn't even in this. But the, but the woman, they drug her out probably in a, in, in a very shameful way with very little clothing on and threw her before Jesus and said, the, the law says, true, 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 true. The law says she needs to be stoned for her acts, for what she's doing. And Jesus, what did he do? He he immediately turns and he just begins to ride in the dirt. And they say, well, didn't you hear us, boy? She needs to be stoned for what's going on. What are you doing just riding in the dirt? And then they begin to look a little bit closer. And Jesus says, you who are without sin cast the first stone. And they, I think... We don't know this for sure, but I think they begin to see what it is that he's writing in the dirt. Maybe he was writing their own sins. Maybe he was writing the people they had been with. I don't know. But one by one, one by one, starting with the oldest to the youngest, they dropped their stones and left. He spoke truth to them. And then he turns with great grace. And he says to the woman, where are your accusers? She says, there are none. Neither do I condemn you. Grace, I love you. I love you. But then he says, truth, go and sin no more. Stop living this way. It's not good. It's not healthy. It's not right for you. It's not good. I love you too much to let you continue down that path that only leads to destruction and heartache and bitterness. I love you too much to let you continue that way. Go and sin no more. There's a better way. There's a better life. Come into the love that I have for you. You see, truth with grace is so good. It's so good. And grace with truth is so loving and so kind. Jesus didn't draw a line in the sand for this woman to say, listen, you got to get things right. you got to get over on this side. you got to step over here and make sure that you live like this. Then you can, you can come to church. Then you can be around me. No, 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 no. He didn't draw a line in the sand. He stepped over the line and he went to the other side. Why? Because there's people over there. And he went to her right where she was at. And this is what I know, that we don't either. We don't draw lines to keep people out. We cross lines to bring people, to love people into a relationship with Jesus. Because it's not about us, it is about him. And so it's not about drawing a line and you got to look like this and act like this. No, it's about crossing the line and going to them and loving them into a relationship with Jesus. Because I've never seen anybody hated into a relationship with Jesus. I've seen a lot of people loved into one. We have to understand there's a difference and we need, we need both. Let me, let me close with this, this illustration real quickly. I, I, there, there is a, a young man and I'm going to call him John. It's not his real name, but John, every time for, for the longest time that, that he would get drunk or get high, he would call me on the phone. And he would call and he, he would say, Mr. Williams, and he would talk to me and this student of mine from way back and call and just pour out his heart and just, oh, I know I shouldn't have done that, shouldn't have done that, you know, and did, the, you know, and I'm so, you know, but, oh, God is good, and, oh, Mr. Williams, you're just, you know, and I would just talk to him and I would pray with him and just love on him and then a few weeks or months later, he'd call again. And I just continued to, to love on him and had him over to my house. And he ate with us. And I remember my kids were really young at that time. And they didn't, they didn't know a lot. They learned more about the world in three minutes in conversation with him than they did their whole life. <laughs> but we just loved on him. And, you know, hey, it's, it's okay. God, God loves you. And, but listen, 
This, this is not healthy. This is not good. God wants better for you. He has so much better for you. And he knew he could probably quote more scripture <laughs> than I could. I mean, he smart young man. He just continued to just kind of go and just be pulled away. But surprise, just one day, just miraculously, just, you know, God did an amazing work, and then he, be, he got in church, and, and then became a leader in the church, and now he's a pastor. No, I just made all that up. <laughs> I wish that were the story. I wish I could say that he completely changed and completely, you know, just on fire for God, but unfortunately, that's not the case. Unfortunately, I still get a phone call every now and then. Still longing, still hurting, still dealing with incredible anxiety, never being able to overcome it, never being able to, but he told me, you know, that one time they were drinking and a bunch of them drunk and they're all blasting and talking about different people, you know, and, you know, people that they don't like and, you know, preachers were one of them and my name came up. And they're like, ah, he just did, no, he point finger, no, and, and, and John said, no, 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 I know Jason. No, I know him. He's not like that. Ah, oh, you don't know. He's just like everybody else all over here. They just, they just can't wait to tell us how bad we're doing. No, 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 no. You know, no. I, I've, I've had dinner with Jason and his family, and, and he's not that way. He's not that way. He just, he wouldn't do that. He's not that way. And by the end of it, he got them to lift their beers and toast to, you know, toast to Jason for, you know, <laughs> Pastor Jason. <laughs> and here's my point with that is that, listen, we're not always going to see a life change take place. It's really not even our job to see life change happen. That's God's job. But our job is to love on people. Still speak the truth. Still, still point to the tr truth. Still show them Jesus because Jesus is truth. We need to love people right where they're at, even in their mess. Because you know what? At one point, I was a mess. Yeah, I might not have looked like it on the outside, you know, according to some. But I was a mess without Jesus. And you were too. And we don't have any good reason to point our finger and just stand on the side of truth. Because we all need grace wasn't for the grace of Jesus, we wouldn't be here today. You wouldn't be here today. And so we need to remember that when we choose to exercise truth over grace. And we also need to realize we can't just live with grace all the time and just live however we want. No. It's not about doing whatever we want and living however we want. It is about understanding there is truth and his name is Jesus. He wants good for you, but we need to be able to walk that line. We need to be able to live that out with him. Some people do reject Christianity, and most of the time they're rejecting a watered-down, distorted view of Christianity. And guess what? I would reject that too. We need to see and show who Jesus really is. We need to display the things of Christ everything that we do and how we live and then I believe people would want to follow that Jesus showed both grace and truth he showed a kind of grace that 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 was that was scandalous it was it was a type of grace that was undeserved by all of us it was irrational and he lavished it on us that's what Jesus did when he died on the cross he shows a truth that is living and uncompromised. Not to condemn, but to set you free. Because truth sets us free. Truth is so freeing when we really understand it. And we couple it with grace. Amen?